Okay, so we might make a start. Uh, so welcome everybody to our latest Lunch to Learn uh, on accessible social media. Uh, this particular topic is quite an important one uh, because often when we talk about accessibility, we you know, consider things like websites and apps. Um, but in today, a lot of what's done on the internet and the web is actually done through social media. Um, so, and a lot of times social media is meant to be social and people can often be left out of the picture uh, when it comes to uh, being able to access all the information and uh, the things that are being discussed. Um, before we begin as well, um, I will highlight that uh, this session is being live captioned. So if you do want to turn on the captions, uh, there should be a closed caption button uh, at the bottom of uh, your, Zoom, uh, your, your Zoom app. Uh, so introducing who's talking today. Um, so we have Rosie Luscombe. Um, she's one of our newest members of the team. Um, and recently put an article out on accessible social media. Um, there was also a checklist and an infographic uh, that went along with it. Um, so I'll stop talking now and I'll um, let Rosie start. So welcome, Rosie. Thank you so much for that, Josh. Um, I'm really excited to be here today um, and talking to you all about um, accessible social media. Uh, I'm gonna get started straight away because uh, we have a lot to get through and I wanna be able to get through as much content as possible. Um, so this is accessible social media. As Josh said, I'm Rosie Luscombe. I'm a digital accessibility officer um, from the digital access team at Vision Australia. Um, on the screen, we have a little drawing um, of an uh, iPhone and we have the Facebook app open um, and it has a post from Vision Australia that says social media accessibility. Is my button working? No. There we go. Um, so to give a little overview of what we're gonna talk about today. So first of all, we're going to talk about how social media accessibility is different from website accessibility. And we're gonna talk about some of the limitations that come with um, social media accessibility. Then we're going to move on to our three main tips, um, which are color contrast, alt text and captions. Then we're gonna go into some extra tips, which are more text um, for text-based content. Um, and then we're gonna, um, give a few resources, but I will give resources throughout the presentation. So first of all, um, social media accessibility versus website accessibility. So unfortunately, um, we can't fix inaccessible social media platforms ourselves. Um, this can only be done by the platform um, itself. And so we are limited to the accessibility features on the platform. Um, social media accessibility focuses more on the changes that you can make to your content production. Whereas website accessibility includes changes also to your content production, but the user interface design. So moving on to our first uh, point, um, color contrast and use of color. I like to group these together because you know they're both to do with color and I think they go along really well together. So first of all, what is color contrast? The contrast ratio, it's the contrast ratio um, between the foreground color, which is usually the text color and the background color. So as the foreground color and the background color move closer together in hue and brightness levels, the contrast ratio will be smaller. Um, so we say, uh, like all our accessibility gurus like to say that, and um, WCAG likes to say that contrast should be at least 4.5 to one um, with some exceptions uh, such as logos. But what does this mysterious 4.5 to one mean? Um, to put this in context, uh, black text on a white background or vice versa has the highest possible contrast ratio of 21 to one. Um, this is demonstrated um, in a screenshot I have um, on the slide, um, and it's a screenshot from a color contrast analyzer, which we will talk a bit more about later, um, but it has, it's contrasting between the foreground color and the background color, foreground color being black and the background color being white, and it's showing that the WCAG 2.1 results say 21 to 1. Um, we have another example um, in the screenshot, and we've got a, a foreground color of a dark blue and the background color of a bright yellow. These are the Vision Australia branding colors. Um, and this has a contrast ratio of 11.7 to one. So it's still um, meeting the threshold of at least 4.5 to one. Um, to give more context to that, the lowest possible contrast ratio you can have is one to one, which usually means invisible and you've got two of the same color contrasting to each other. 
Um, so how does this relate to social media? It might just sound like a bunch of like garbled nonsense at the moment. Um, but to talk about what a failing colour contrast actually looks like in real life, um, we have an example here from a post of, uh, from Instagram. Um, it's made by Duck Doe, who's an anonymous duck. And they're advertising their new duck t-shirts by posting an image with a light blue background with white text that says, check out our new duck t-shirts. This image has been liked by Mallard and a hundred other um, people or ducks maybe. And Duck Doe has hashtag duck party and quack. So this image also has a comment, which is made by Duck Detective, who says that this text within the Instagram tile only has a contrast ratio of 2.7 to one. Now this is a problem because um, as we previously stated, contrast should always be at least 4.5 to one. And so this means that any of DuckDo's followers who are low vision may not be able to read the text and know about the Duck t-shirts. To demonstrate what DuckDo could do instead, um, I have some examples of passing colour contrast. So it's uh, the same as the previous example um, in terms of what's in the post, um, except for in the first example, we have a screenshot where DuckDo has changed the color of the background uh, to a dark blue text on a, um, sorry, dark blue background on a white text. And Duck Detective has commented on this saying it has an 8.6 to one ratio. So definitely meeting the 4.5 to one with the, the just a simple change. We also have another example of something Duck Doe could do, which is to keep the light blue background color, but to change the color to a black text. Um, Duck Detective has commented on this one saying that has a colour contrast ratio of 7.9 to 1. So again, definitely meeting the threshold um, of colour contrast ratio and ensuring that Duck Doe's followers um, can see, uh, Duck Doe's low vision followers will be able to see the text. So for some general colour contrast tips to consider when uh, making your posts, um, when posting images, we should ensure that any text within the image contrasts well with the background. Um, we should avoid dark text on dark backgrounds and we should avoid light text on light backgrounds. Some of the danger colours to look out for um, are light blues and oranges used with a white text. Um, this applies to all platforms of social media when you're making image-based content. So how do we test colour contrast? There are two different ways of testing color contrast. Um, both ways involve using a color contrast analyzer, and they're just sort of two different formats of using it. So there is an eyedropper um, and also a hex code input. And it sort of depends where you're making your content and um, how you best like to make your content it will depend um, on which sort of tool you want to use. Um, there's also a tool called a color contrast determinator. Uh, which can be really helpful in, um, you know, you found out that you've tested your content with a colour contrast analyzer and you found out, you know, maybe it's 4.3 to 1 and it's not quite meeting that 4.5. A colour contrast determinator can be really helpful as it helps you find the next nearest colour that has a passing colour contrast. So you can still keep that same theme that you're after, but meeting colour contrast. Um, my colleague um, Matt is going to put some links um, for both of these tools uh, within the chat um, and we'll link other tools throughout the presentation as well. So moving on from colour contrast to use of colour. So what is use of colour? It's when colour alone is used to portray information. So on this slide we have a little uh, colouring in that's been completely coloured in of uh, a little duck. So what's an example of use of colour? Like how, how can we understand it? So here we have an example of some bad use of colour. Um, Duck Doe is at it again. And this time they've posted on Twitter with a pie graph that contains the results of a vote for what is the best duck. Each section of the pie graph is slight, a slightly different shade of blue. And there are three labels which are a part of the key at the bottom of the graph. The labels are mallard, teal and domestic duck. Each label has a small square with a colour in it that corresponds to a colour on the pie graph. This is problematic and causes a classic example of using colour alone to represent information, or in this case, data. This affects people who are colourblind and low vision, 
as they may find it difficult to differentiate between the colors and associate them with the correct label. And this means that they may not be able to perceive the content or the data in this image. Also, using color alone can affect people with cognitive and or intellectual disabilities, as having to associate the colors with the, uh, from the graph with the key may be too much of a cognitive load. People with these sorts of disabilities often require multiple ways to confirm a piece of information. Using only color can cause overwhelm and mistrust of the content. So how can we fix this? How can we uh, make this better um, and easier to understand for a lot of uh, different audience groups? So here's an example um, of a, a good use of color. Um, in this graph, we still have the same post um, and the still, still the same graph with the same data. Uh, but, and it's titled the best duck. And then we have three segments of the graph, which are three completely different colors. Whereas previously we had all different slight shades of blue. Also another change made to this graph is that the label is actually placed within the segment of the graph, making it much easier to associate um, the, the data with the label. Um, also with the label, we have it contrasting well. So we have a little background on it. So it's not just uh, the word on the background of the segment. We actually have a white box around it so that the white and the black text stand out. Another improvement, which is more of a usability improvement is that we have actually put the percentages of the data on the graph, which makes it much easier to see who's actually won. So we can see that domestic duck um, has 40% of the vote, mallard has 30% of the vote, and teal has 30% of the vote. So we can much more clearly see that domestic duck has won the best duck vote. So moving on to some general use of color tips. So um, the first tip is to avoid using a color key alone to convey content. Um, we should also avoid using language that gives direction using color alone. So an example of this is you can find that information on the red tile of our Instagram feed. Now, if you're colorblind, this is not very helpful. Um, like imagine if the Instagram feed has a bunch of red tiles and a bunch of green tiles, you may not be able to tell which is a red tile or which is a green, green tile. Also, this sort of direction uh, makes it really hard for uh, users who are blind and maybe use a screen reader um, as the screen reader is not going to tell them um, that th this is a red tile. So it can be difficult for people to navigate and actually find out what you're talking about. So moving on to how to test use of colour, um, some links will be available in the chat uh, based on what I talk about. Um, the first one is to use a black and white filter on your work before posting it to ensure that it can be understood. Um, but by using a, a filter, you can sort of see whether you are just using colour alone. Another good way is to put the filter on as well, but get a colleague or um, have someone else take a look at it and make sure that it can still be understood uh, without colour. Alternatively, um, you can try uploading your image to a colour blindness simulator, um, which can help you see that as well. So moving on to the next main section, which is alt text. So you've probably been thinking, wait a second, uh, all these images have text on them, isn't like that's not accessible. What about alt text? Um, so that's what we're going to talk about now. So alt text or alternative text is a visually hidden description of what appears in an image. The reason why it's visually hidden is that people who are blind and low vision um, can use assistive technologies called screen readers, which reads the description to them. Um, Alt text can be added to images before posting on all major social media platforms. Um, this is with the exclusion of Instagram and Facebook stories. So when should you add alt text? Um, images on social media are a little bit different than images on a website. On a website, we break images into groups called decorative and informative. And these are, uh, Decorative images do not give any additional information and are generally considered background images. Images posted to social media are almost always informative, um, especially when it comes to posting for a business or an organization or government department. So in saying this, um, on social media, 
images should always have alt text. And this is because it is just so rare that social media posts will contain a truly decorative image. Even if someone is posting a lot of pictures um, on their personal Instagram account for, uh, of sunsets, um, that still tells us something about what that person likes and what they like to do. So it's important to still um, include alt text on those images. On this uh, slide, we have a little screenshot of someone adding an alt text on Twitter to a photograph of a duck. So we're gonna go into an example of um, how to write alt text. So uh, we're taking an example that is similar to before. Duckdo is posting a picture of the shirts they are selling. Um, the caption of the image says, check out our new duck t-shirts. The caption tells us a bit about what the post is about. But if you can't see the image, you'd be missing out on key information. And that is the deciding factor of whether you want to visit maybe DuckDo's website and buy the shirt. And then what if the website also doesn't have alt text on the image? You wouldn't know what the shirt looks like and you probably just wouldn't buy the shirt. So what shouldn't we write when writing alt text? So I've got uh, three examples on the side of uh, things that we shouldn't write. And the first example is image of t-shirt. Now, image of t-shirt isn't that descriptive and it isn't providing the user with that much more additional information than what's already in the caption. So we shouldn't use that and we shouldn't say image of because uh, the screen reader is already going to know it's an image. The screen reader does announce that it's an image. So there's no need for us to write image of. The second example is duck shirt. Maybe this is a little bit more descriptive, but we can still get this information out of the caption. And now the third example um, says white background with two plain basic snow white t-shirts with no buttons. The border of the t-shirt is a thick black line and there are dotted lines that represent the seams of the t-shirt. Printed on the front of the t-shirt is a majestic looking duck with a golden yellow bill and a solemn looking eye. The duck has white downy feathers and is round in nature. The duck is printed in a medium to large size and in the left hand corner of the shirt. And the front of the back of the shirt has a duck printed in the center and is small in size. Now, obviously we don't wanna do an alt text like this as well. This becomes an alt text essay and this is, just too verbose. We don't need this much information. And it actually sort of becomes confusing what the shirt is actually all about when we read this alt text. So what can we write for alt text? So in this example, um, I've provided three examples of what maybe we could write for alt text. I wrote two of the examples and I had a colleague um, write one of the examples as well. Um, and this is because in general, I think the best way to write alt text is to write it as if someone had called out to you from the next room to ask you what this t-shirt looked like. Um, there is no correct way to write an alt text. It is subjective and it can cause debates. But the most important thing is that you do write an alt text and it is enough to ensure that the screen reader user is not missing out on key information. So the first example, um, I just have to move this little camera. Uh, the first example says two sides of a white t-shirt. The front has a white duck with a yellow bill. The duck is large and positioned in the corner of the shirt. The back of the shirt has a second print of the same duck, but small and in the center top of the shirt. So that's one example you could do. The second example is white crew neck t-shirt showing the front and back. The front has a large white duck on it and the back has a small duck. And the third example is a white t-shirt with a large cartoon white duck on the front and a small cartoon white duck on the back. So each of these uh, focuses on this sort of a different area. The first one is sort of focusing on the positioning of the duck. Uh, the second one is focusing on what's the style of t-shirt. And the third one is focusing on the style of the duck. So it's a cartoon duck. And this just shows that everyone has a different perception um, of what should be described. And all of these are, are still correct. So maybe you're thinking, okay, that's well, all well and good. I could write an alt text for a simple image. Well, I hope that you're thinking that. Um, but what about really complex images? What about images that have a lot of words on them? They have a lot of information on them, um, something like an infographic. Um, and I, so I have an example of this. And the important thing about infographics um, is to 
is to make sure that we do have an alternative for the infographic. So not just an image. Um, and so we made an infographic uh, for the article that goes along with this presentation, social media accessibility. Um, and so this infographic has a lot of different information, a lot of do's and don'ts um, and extra tips on it and a lot of different colors. Um, so the alt text we actually provided for this image is a chart showcasing some of the do's and don'ts of social media. A full screen reader accessible version is available on the link above. Now, um, this doesn't describe everything that's in the image, but we do provide uh, a long text description, which I'll show you on the next slide, um, that does describe everything on the image. So what we should be doing with the alt text of a complex image is pointing the user to where they can find the full description of it. So in this example, um, the link went to the article. Um, and we had the PDF of the infographic that you can download, but we also had a Word document um, of the long text description of this infographic, um, which you can read on the article um, and we'll provide the link to that as well for you. Um, so the long text description on this has a, as a heading that says what it is. Um, it also has a brief description of what the infographic looks like. And then uh, we have all the text um, that, is, that is on the infographic. Um, so now you could do this with uh, like a comic. Um, it doesn't have to be an infographic. It uh, just is a, a complex images, image. Um, so you may be thinking, you know, what if I don't have a website? What if there's not an article attached to this? Um, I do this quite often with something called Pastebin. Um, it allows you to generate a really simple text web website that contains your long text description and it can be linked really easily. Um, so I use that a lot for comics. Um, just to repeat, that is called paste bin. All right, so um, my colleague Matt is gonna provide some links in the chat for you for this slide. It is how to add alt text. So we've learned a bit about how to write alt text and what are some of the do's and don'ts of alt text, but each different social media platform has a different way of adding alt text. Um, and so the links posted in the chat will give you a step-by-step -step of how to add alt text on each of the platforms listed, which is Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Um, I don't think it's worth me stepping you through them because there's so many good resources out there that, that do step through it. Um, I've also got a sub point which says social media management tools and the only two social media management tools that I've found that have um, that ha completely cover all uh, social medias in terms of being able to add alt text to scheduled posts is Hootsuite and Sprout Social. Um, now these are both uh, great applications in that you can add the alt text uh, when you're, um, oh sorry I lost my train of thought, uh, you can add the alt text when scheduling posts uh, with the exception of Instagram in, uh, because their API doesn't allow third parties to be able to add the alt text to it. Um, so if you don't use one of these social media management tools that allow alt text when scheduling and you can't or you aren't allowed to manually add the alt text, you can add an image description to the caption of the post. This is not ideal um, as screen reader users may not know that the image description is there. And when Facebook places an auto alt text um, on the image, they may assume that there won't be an alt text at all, even in the caption as an image description. But if you absolutely cannot um, add alt text for whatever reason, it is better to have an image description than to have no alt text at all. So some general alt text tips. Uh, first of all, describe the most important and the most informational elements of all images. Don't start your alt text with image of and include all text within the image. We shouldn't be writing an alt text essay as much as you may want to get your poetry out there. Um, we shouldn't be being too general. And if the image is complex, we should be considering writing a long text description and to provide a link to that long text description that directs uh, and the alt text should be directing the user to that link. Our final main section is captions. So what are captions? Captions are a text-based alternative to a multimedia content. Um, they should include spoken dialogue and sound effects from the original soundtrack, um, and they're displayed on the screen in real time. 
Um, you may have heard captions and you may have heard the term subtitles and um, what's the difference between them. So these terms are often used interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. The main difference is that subtitles do not include important sound effects and are mainly used to translate between different languages. You may have heard the term open captions um, and closed captions and what's the difference between them. So closed captions, they can be turned on or off according to the preference or the needs of the viewer. This is mainly seen on social media through YouTube. Um, and then we have open captions or sometimes referred to as burned in captions. Um, and these are captions that cannot be turned off and are embedded into the video. This is mainly seen on Instagram stories and uh, TikTok videos, but this has recently changed um, as TikTok now has an auto captioning um, sort of service that you can turn on and off. So we're going to talk about some of the dangers of auto captions and you may have already uh, picked what the danger is here. Um, but this is the ex New South Wales Premier Mike Baird. Um, and he is talking about, um, he's saying the government that pretty simply comes down to investing in alligators. And if you're deaf, that might not make sense because why, why would you invest in alligators? Um, but the actual dialogue on this uh, video is that it, that it pretty simply comes down to investing in our leaders, which maybe makes a bit more sense. And although investing in alligators is pretty funny and uh, we have a little cute alligator there to represent that, without captions or with inaccurate captions, those who are deaf or hard of hearing may not be able to access your content. Um, and captioning can also be essential for some people with cognitive disabilities. So how to add captions. Um, the links to how to, the step-by-step -step for each of these will be um, posted in the chat, but you can add uh, captions on TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can add captions to some social media sites through your social media management tools. Um, both Hootsuite and Sprout Social um, allow caption files to be added to posts. For Hootsuite, these files can be added to Facebook posts, but it's sort of unclear um, if they can be added to other platforms. For Sprout Social, caption files can be added for posts on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. So some general captioning tips to sort of round out this, um, this third topic is that if you use auto captions, um, you should ensure to review and edit them. So we don't have uh, the New South Wales Premier saying investing in alligators, and we should include important sounds in your captions. Uh, for example, a doorbell being rung, as these sounds can give context and uh, meaning and understanding uh, to what's, be what's going on. Um, if you're writing open captions or burned in captions, make sure that the text is readable and has a passing color contrast and isn't obscured by logos or profile pictures once it's uploaded. Moving on to our final section, which is extra tips for text-based content. My first tip is to ensure that hashtags are camel cased for readability. And so basically what camel cased means is that we capitalize the first letter of each word in a multi-word hashtag. Um, so this is the difference between reading ducks are epic versus hashtag duck sorry pick. Now this has um, two different sort of effects for different user groups. Um, the first, first effect is that it's pretty hard to read without the, um, without the capitalization of each word. Um, and so this can affect um, you know, users with dyslexia and they may not be able to understand what the, uh, the hashtag is actually saying, uh, but also affects screen readers. Um, I've done a little test recently and um, on this one in particular with NVDA, uh, the screen reader for the first hashtag will read ducks are epic and for the second hashtag will read duck sorry pick which is not what we were trying to get across in this um the second tip is to leave hashtags and tagged accounts to the end of the post now the reason why we would do this is um so that a screen reader users aren't having to navigate through all the hashtags or all the tagged accounts at the start of the post and they're able to get to the main key information of the post uh, without having to go through a bunch of jumbled mess. So if you haven't camel cased your 
uh, your hashtags, for example, that's going to be a lot of jumbledness to go through before you get to the actual information of the post. And I forgot to mention before, there is a little illustration of a camel um, who has hashtag camel cased across his back. Another tip is to limit emoji use to uh, one emoji of each type in a row. Um, we have a little screenshot on, uh, on the slide, which has like 50 duck emojis in a row of a tweet. Um, and for a screen reader user, that's just going to read duck emoji, duck emoji, duck emoji, duck emoji, which is not really fun or helpful and creates a lot of noise for screen reader users. This isn't to say we shouldn't ever use emojis, emojis are bad. Um, I don't think that at all. I think emojis can be really useful as tone indicators um, for people with cognitive disabilities to make sure that the, the meaning um, of your post and of your words is actually getting across to those users. So it's not saying to never use emojis, just to make sure that we use them purposefully. Um, another tip is to avoid using fancy typography in text captions. We have a little screenshot of a bunch of different fancy typographies. Uh, um, and this can cause a lot of um, issues for a lot of different users. It may be really, really hard to read for screen reader users. It may just read as a jumbled mess and read as like nothing text. Um, and for users with uh, like cognitive disabilities um, and intellectual disabilities such as dyslexia, this may be really hard to read for them. Moving on to the final tips. Um, the one of my final tips is to keep sarcasm and metaphors to a minimum. If it is necessary to use them, make sure that they're clear and explained so, um, so that the purpose and the, the meaning of your, um, your content is actually getting across to users. Um, some, some people with disabilities, um, such as autism, such as myself, find sarcasm and metaphors are really hard to understand. And when uh, when companies are using them a lot, um, I, I just don't engage with it because I, I don't understand what they're trying to say to me. Um, and so we, we should be keeping sarcasm and metaphors to a minimum. And if we are using them, we should be explaining them. And the same goes for jargon and acronyms. We should be making sure that they are clear and explained and really knowing our audience. I think with both of these tips, we should be knowing our audience and knowing what they are going to understand and making sure we think about if someone outside of our audience saw it, um, what would they think and would they understand it? And is this good for being able to gain new audience members? All right. So my final text-based slide um, is resources. So anything that is mentioned in today's webinar can be found in our blog post which is how to make social media accessible, our top three tips. Um, this includes a downloadable social media accessibility checklist, which is in um, Word. And it also includes a downloadable social media accessibility infographic, which is a PDF. Um, I'm hoping that some people have printed it out and maybe laminated it and put it in their, their office as a good reminder of, of some of these tips. We also do have a, a long text description for um, that infographic as well. Um, and my colleague Matt should be linking that in the chat right now. Um, if you would like to learn more about social media um, and accessibility, and you're sort of in that comms and marketing space, we do provide an online course called Accessible Communications and Marketing, um, which is a really, really good one to get along to and to expand your knowledge even further from today. Um, so I'd just like to Thank everyone so much um, for listening in to me, word vomit, um, all these amazing things that, or I think they're amazing things about accessibility. Um, I'm gonna hand back over to Josh um, to go to questions. Just before I do that on this slide, we have a little question mark and we also have a little illustration under the question mark. It's an illustration of me. Um, I have brown hair and big rosy cheeks um, and I'm wearing uh, a yellow t-shirt with a rainbow dungarees. Um, I'm holding a duck because I absolutely love ducks. Um, but I'll hand back over to you, Josh. Thanks, Rosie. Uh, that was great. Uh, so yeah, we might move on to um, some questions uh, Some questions first. Um, so firstly, um, I know some of you submitted questions uh, prior to uh, the session today. Um, and we've picked one uh, that Rosie is going to answer from that. Uh, so the question was, how do you ensure GIF slash animations are accessible, especially when it is animated and has text within the animation? 
Yeah, so this is a really great question. And I, I really wanted to answer this one live as I didn't get to address it in my presentation as there's just so much to cover and, and so much to learn. Um, GIFs and animations can be made accessible for people who are blind or low vision for, by providing a long text description, um, a transcript um, or an audio description. Like we talked about um, providing a long text description for a complex image, the same sort of uh, things can be applied uh, to a GIF or an animation. Um, you know, this needs to be either provided within the post or as a comment below the GIF or animation or, um, or a link to the description of the animation or the GIF. Um, you know, this can also apply to other multimedia content, such as like a YouTube video with a lot of informative imagery or uh, a text that appears um, in the video, but it isn't spoken, um, a text alternative should always be provided. Uh, was there another question in the chat uh, where somebody asked, um, so in relation to the pie chart, mm -hmm. uh, if it's too small to label it, uh, is it okay to label outside the piece of the pie with a pointer? Yeah, I think that could definitely be a good solution. Um, the, the example I gave was just one of the possible solutions you could do. There's many different creative solutions I've seen people come up, but having an arrow um, from the label to the pie chart is a really good idea. Great. Uh, we had another question. Uh, mm -hmm. Avoid uh, jargon and acronyms. How about mm -hmm. abbreviations? Uh, for example, contracting straight to ST, or road to RD? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's a really interesting one. I hadn't thought of that one before. Um, but I think sort of the general rule is the first time you use it, like, especially if it's a, a, lot, a long piece of text, uh, the first time you use it to write it out fully. And then if you're using it again, um, to, you, can, you can use the abbreviation as long as you've sort of specified what that abbreviation would be. Um, I'm not entirely sure on that one, but for me personally, I think it would be best to write out the whole word to um, ensure that, you know, no meaning is sort of um, getting confused. I know when, you you know, you have street and road and then you have boulevard and then you have some of these sort of crazy street names that have weird acronyms that people might not know the words for. So I think it's always a good idea to write it out if you can. Uh, we also had, uh, and this is a good one actually that applies to websites as well. Uh, so yeah, talking about, um, so yeah, the question is on the link above, I thought we do not say above or below or on the left uh, because the direct, direction is not meaningful to everyone. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, in We can use um, below, uh, especially in like a social media post. It is, uh, I think it is okay to use below because it is directly below and it will be the next thing that um, can be navigated to. In general, um, on websites, it is uh, better to use like, it is like WCAG conformant to not use directional um, like speech, like on the left or on the right, um, because someone using a screen reader uh, may not have a perception of what's left and right on the screen. Um, and, you know, people with cognitive disabilities may not uh, be able to perceive lefts and rights as well. So yeah, you are exactly right. Um, we shouldn't be using that directional speech in the same way we don't use, um, you know, the red tile or the green tile on the Instagram feed. It's it's similar to that. Um, I think below is, correct me if I'm wrong, Josh, but I think below is generally uh, more accepted because, because of the focus order. Yeah, so um, if we're talking about people who are blind, uh, typically what the screen reader does, and uh, if anyone who doesn't know what a screen reader is, um, it's a bit of technology that reads out what's on the screen to them using sort of like a robot voice. And that will typically look at the order of the code. It, it will read out content in the order of um, the code. So um, if you say, for example, below the image, um, there's a more detailed description or something like that, uh, then they would understand that it's below the image because it's below that in the source code order, um, in, in the order that the screen reader would uh, read it out. Okay. Uh, We've got another one. Uh, are videos with text presented in artistic, funky ways, e.g. some lyric music videos, problematic due to the extra cognitive load of working out what's going on, um, and also potentially uh, colour contrast issues? Yeah, so, um, you know, this, <coughs> excuse me, um, this is sort of an interesting question. Uh, WCAG, which is sort of the guidelines that we, we follow um, for websites uh, really harshly, and then we are uh, 
sort of apply them to social media. Wicker says that if it's uh, artistic um, and it's using like really artistic font, then uh, color contrast doesn't need to be met for font um, because it's, you know, sort of considered art. Um, so, you know, videos with that uh, will generally pass uh, because because it's considered art and it, it's not sort of held to those 4.1, uh, 4.5 standards. Um, in terms of cognitive load, um, yeah, I think you're you're correct in that it can, it can um, sort of a lot of flashing colours and bright lights and stuff can cause um, additional cognitive load and trying to figure out what's going on. I've certainly experienced that myself, um, but there's sort of no standards um, around that currently. Um, I would suggest, you know, considering your audience and, and considering like who you're sharing to um, before maybe sharing something like that. Yeah, I think um, it's important to distinguish between maybe what's uh, functional type of, types of content. So where people are looking for information. Um, and in that instance, yes, yeah, certainly this is going to present a number of issues, potentially around color contrast, um, potentially around it being distracting. Uh, and um, but if you're talking about, yeah, like Rosie said, it's actually a piece of art, then it's going to be really a judgment decision on being aware that some people may not be able to um, read the text um, as opposed to, um, you know, creative expression. Okay, I've just had another question uh, around uh, YouTube accessibility. Uh, has anybody, yeah, Rosie, do you have any uh, feedback on whether YouTube is accessible or not? Um, yeah, that's <laughs> that's a really big question. Um, you know, there's sort of there's definitely a lot of different elements. I mean, um, at the moment, you can add you know your closed captions to it. You can turn on auto captions. You can edit those. Um, so in terms of captioning, um, I think you know we're doing pretty well on that sort of front. Um, you know, there is still a, sort of an issue where if you do want to provide an audio described video. Um, so for those who don't know, an audio described video is uh, literally describing the imagery that is sort of there. Um, and it's sort of the audio description falls between the dialogue. Um, so there's no, uh, you do have to completely upload a new video if you would like to uh, make an audio described version. Um, I would really like to see in the future that we're able to toggle on and off audio description like we can with, do, we can with captions. Um, rather than having to upload a whole new video. I'm not really sure about sort of the creator side of, of YouTube and how accessible that is. Um, I don't know if you have more comments on that, Josh. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, right now, we still have to upload separate versions of the video. Um, so you can have a um, non-audio described version and then audio described version. Um, I did see a beta test that Google was running last year where you could toggle audio description on and off. Um, so hopefully they continue with that uh, research and um, roll it out uh, sometime in the near future. Okay, uh, we had a question. Uh, the new Facebook business suite, which is, has integrated publishing tools, uh, doesn't seem to have a field for alt text when adding images. Uh, is this anyone else's experience? Um, I'm just checking, Rosie. Yeah, is that one you've had a chance to look at? Or, um, um, I haven't had a chance to look at the business suite. Um, I, I don't know without looking at it, um, but I uh, sometimes I've had issues with adding alt text like before I'm posting it. Um, so it may just be sort of um, at the moment that you can only add it after posting it, which is like really unfortunate and kind of annoying. Um, I don't know without looking at it though. I haven't haven't seen that, but I will I will definitely look into it because yeah, that's important. Yeah, we'll um, we'll try to we'll take a look after the session and uh, if we find anything about that, we'll um, include that in a, in a follow up email uh, to everyone who's registered. Okay, and uh, we have another question. Uh, what are the most popular screen readers right now? Um, I can probably actually answer this yeah, one. Yeah, you go uh, for that. So um, the Jaws screen reader is still the most, the number one uh, product. Uh, it's quite expensive still. So I think it's around $1,200, um, but it is funded under the NDIS. So um, if anybody wants to use it, um, they can often often get funding for it. Um, that's for web, uh, and usually it's for, it's for a desktop computer uh, or a laptop. Um, the next most popular one on Windows is NVDA. Um, that's a free screen reader um, that, that's open source and uh, it's also quite popular. And um, I know a lot of 
uh, my colleagues even at Vision Australia uh, use it on their personal computers um, when they're browsing the web and uh, things like that. Um, when it comes to mobile devices and tablets, uh, the number one by far is uh, iOS devices or um, iPhones and iPads. Uh, the screen reader on that is called VoiceOver. Um, it's available for free. It comes with the devices. And we estimate that uh, iOS devices have captured around 70 to 80% of the uh, mobile and tablet market. Uh, but we are planning on doing um, a bit more uh, statistical research around that in Australia um, to try to get some um, more precise figures. Um, there's also TalkBack on Android, and I think the version on uh, Samsung devices is called Voice Assist. Um, that is great, gaining some popularity, um, but we estimate it's around 20%, 20 to 30% of, um, of the blind community. Um, so then the main uh, screen readers that people use. Um, there's some other ones that have very low usage. So Narrator, for example, um, on Windows, but it is steadily improving. Um, and similar with VoiceOver on a desktop Mac um, or a, a Mac laptop. Um, so they're the main ones. Um, but yeah, by far the most popular are JAWS, NVDA, and uh, VoiceOver on iPhones and iPads. Okay. Uh, so I've got a, one more question. Uh, what would you suggest for a video tutorial on using some website features? Um, so would you suggest a long text version? Um, so it's not, it gets yeah. a little bit out of, outside of the social media realm, unless it's being posted on social media. Um, but yeah, do you want to give that one a go, Rosie? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, if you're providing a description of like how to use something on a website, um, I, I would definitely recommend a transcript. Um, as well, um, people who are deafblind uh, won't be able to hear an audio description. Uh, so a transcript is a good way to make sure that we're covering all audiences. Um, but when using, you know, when doing a tutorial on how to use things um, on a website, yeah, I would just be careful with that because, you know, uh, people who are using screen readers are probably going to use the website in a little bit of a different way. So, you, you know, you may be using language that doesn't really make sense to them um, in the way that they navigate the web. Um, so yeah, it, it would be something to consider. I don't know, Josh, if you sort of have anything to add to that. Yeah, I think um, if you are providing a video tutorial, providing a text version uh, below the video, it's actually a pr pretty common uh, design pattern. So I know a lot of the technology providers and, and software providers, if you go to their support areas, they'll often uh, use that as, a, um, as the two options. Um, really what we're talking about is, um, it's likely to be that for a lot of people who are blind, they might prefer the text version uh, because a, a video is usually quite visual. Um, and then you might find that um, people with low literacy or dyslexia, for example, uh, might prefer the, the video version. Um, so we, yeah, we've got to kind of support a diverse range of needs uh, in, in that scenario. Okay, I can see just a couple more questions in the chat. Uh, so yeah, Danielle's asked, uh, what are your thoughts on immersive reader in the Microsoft suite? Uh, I'm not sure if yet, yeah, Rosie, if you had a chance to look at that one. Yeah, um, I actually use this myself um, a lot. I, I don't know if it's exactly immersive reader, but I use the read aloud on Edge. Is that the same or is it slightly different? Sorry. Uh, I think it's slightly different, um, but yeah, closely related. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. You, you yes. want to talk about your experience with um, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, as someone with a cognitive disability, like I, I do use um read aloud whenever I am reading articles um on websites. I just find it uh, easier, and I, I like the tracking of being able to see the words as I hear them. Um, my only gripe is I don't think it goes fast enough because um, I read quite fast. So I mean, if anyone you know knows their contacts at uh, uh, Edge let them know that I'd like it a bit faster. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's a really great tool and I, I wish I knew about it sooner personally. Um, yeah. yeah. That's great. Uh, all right, so um, there's, I know there's a couple of questions we haven't answered um, that we might follow up on an email. Um, so we might finish this session uh, just a little bit early. Um, so yeah, thanks to you everyone for uh, attending the Lunch and Learn today. Um, the video is going to be posted of this session up to our YouTube shortly, our YouTube channel. And um, as we mentioned at the start, um, Rosie's also produced an article um, on our website. So um, there'll be an article, uh, the infographics downloadable. Uh, there's also a printable version um, and there's also a checklist. Um, so yeah, hopefully um, this is going to help you provide some support uh, to yourself and also um, for your colleagues.
I had somebody ask the question, can I show the recording of this video to my students? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so it'll be publicly available on YouTube. Um, so feel free to share it with um, anybody that, who you like. Um, really, we really just want to get the word out, here, out there on this. Uh, yeah, so thank you, everyone. And um, yeah, thank you, Rosie. Um, I think it was a great session. And um, yeah, hopefully we might uh, hear from some of you or you attend some of our future sessions um, in the near future. Uh, so thanks, everyone. I'll just, I'll just read the contact details um, finally. Um, so any of the digital access contact details can be found on our website, which has been linked. Um, I don't want to put it in the chat because I think that'll be a bit easier if you, if you navigate to the website. Um, my contact details, I'm Rosie Luscombe. You can find me um, on Twitter at BeatBoopRosie and my email is uh, rosie.luscombe at visionaustralia.org. So if you have any further questions, uh, feel free to give me an email. Okay, uh, yeah, so thanks everyone and 